Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this workers' retreat. And we're grateful to you for all that we've been learning since we came. Not only that we have been learning, you have been leading us to pray. So that we can settle things that need to be settled in our lives. So that we can be ready and prepared anytime you will come. We pray, O oh Lord, that as we look into your word now, you take all the masks and all the things that cover our eyes, that blindfold us spiritually, you take everything away. In Jesus' name, make your mind clear and bear to everyone. That as we see these things, that we we'll have faith and know that these are the words of God which will definitely come to pass. Help us, Lord, in our study. And help us in our, uh, in our receiving everything that you want us to receive. In Jesus' name we pray. The session we have now is Bible teaching. And in the nature of Bible teaching, we'll need to pay close attention and follow through as we read the Bible together and we look at the Word. Especially these important words that many people in our world and many people in various churches are ignorant about. The Bible teaching this morning is titled Prophetic Significance of Noah's Days. Prophetic Significance of Noah's Days. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Was in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the meal. The one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. These verses came out of the leaves of Jesus Christ himself. And he emphasized the very fact that he will be coming again. But then he says of that day and a specific hour, no man knows, that even the angels of heaven do not know, but the Father only telling us about the character of the father that the father is greater than all and there are things known to the father not even known to the angels and of course if there are things known unto the father not known to the angels there are things known to god and not known unto men except what he reveals the educators of this world do not have all the information. The politicians of this world do not have all the information there is to have. The scientists in this world, they do not have all the information there is about the past, the present, and the future. Even the theologians of this world, would you believe, do not have all the answers 
and the prophets in the churches of this world do not have all the information there is because even the angels do not have all the information but of that day and hour knoweth no man no man no not the angels of heaven but my father only then he says there is an illustration as to what will happen at the end of time or at the end of the age the events that will happen in succession as the days of this world are coming to a close he tells us to start with there will be a kind of general condition spiritual condition you will see and when you see those spiritual conditions you know that the end is coming near then it says that you will find a small group of people very few they will be as the days of Noah were. these few people will be highly favored and the favor of God is going to select them and choose them and set them apart that they will not go through what the others will go through you can see that right there not only that he says when that minority has been taken care of and they are in the ark of safety above the flood above the trouble above all the things that will come on the majority then the flood the judgment a great great kind of suffering will come upon the whole world then he tells us do you know that even though these things are getting ready and about to happen that there is general ignorance and that people will be ignorant of these things that will happen he said so in verse 36 no man knoweth and then he says it in verse 38 he said before the flood they were just eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage until the day that noah entered into the ark telling us that there was a general sense of carelessness a general sense of ignorance as if nothing is going to happen as it was the thought so it is this the thought and so shall it ever be and then he said in verse 39 and knew not and knew not does that mean they never heard they heard because Noah was the preacher of righteousness not only that Noah was building a gigantic ark that had never been built and you couldn't build that kind of ark in a private place that will not be known they saw him they knew that he was making some preparation and he was telling them that things are not going to continue the way they are and yet they never believed it says they knew not until the flood came and took them all away and then jesus has show so also shall it be at the coming of the son of man and then it says in verse, 10, in verse 42, it says, as all these things will take place, you will need to watch. Telling us that if believers don't watch, they are going to have their lot like the lot of the people of the world. Because if you are going to be set apart and selected, chosen to be in the ark of safety, while the flood of tribulation is upon this world, you'll need to do something, make an effort, show that you want to be delivered or you want to escape out of that condition. It says, watch therefore. He said, for ye know not. Now he even tells the church, he says, the church does not even know. For ye know not. He said, you may be my disciples and you have forsaken all and you have followed me, yet you do not know all things ye know not it may be that you have even listened to me and i've preached unto you and i've said this and said this i've talked about almost everything to you but there's something you don't know ye know not i think the church needs to awaken to the realization that still god knows some things that the church does not know 
And so nobody in the church should act as if he knows all things there is to know. But because Jesus even told this church and these disciples following after him, he said, For ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. To start with, we need to understand that Jesus Christ was a prophet. Now, the evangelical church has been very, very reserved in emphasizing that Jesus Christ was a prophet. The reason the evangelical church is very reserved about emphasizing it all the time is because there is a religious group of people that only take Jesus Christ as a prophet and they do not take him as savior. And because of that, the evangelical church wants to emphasize the fact that Jesus Christ is Savior. And to lift him up. And that is true. Jesus Christ is Savior. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in him. In him. Not in them as to many prophets. Not in it as to believing catechism. But believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so Jesus Christ the Savior. Do you remember that when that woman left her water pot and went to the town and then came back, although she told them that this is the one that has told me everything that I ever did. I'm sure you remember in the discussion, he said, are you a prophet? And so the prophetic ministry of Jesus was always there. But when the people came, they said, you woman, it's good of what you have told us, but now we know. Not only because of your word, but because we have seen him ourselves, that this is the savior of the world. Yes, Jesus is savior. And we cannot take anything away from that. We cannot minimize that. We cannot limit that. We cannot diminish from that. Jesus Christ is savior. But then you need to understand, he was also king. He was also priest and he was also prophet. And I want you to now for a moment look at the very fact that Jesus Christ was a prophet. In fact, the great prophet above all the other prophets that ever lived. And there's one significance about a prophet. The significance is he tells of the future. And that future when he talks about it... It will definitely come to pass. Let's look at how the Bible looks at Jesus Christ as a prophet. In Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 from verse 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you, of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever, he say unto he shall say unto you, and it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with her fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the king dreads of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Here we are told that Jesus Christ was that prophet, and of the Father God in heaven will put his word in his mouth. And the words he put in his mouth, anyone that will not listen, that will not pay attention, anyone that will not stand upon that word and know that these are the true words of God in particular, he will pay for it dearly. He will suffer for it. Shall be destroyed from among the people. Don't you know that Noah was a prophet unto the people? Telling them what they have never thought about, what they had never seen, what they had never dreamed about, what they had never read in history. 
that the flood was coming, that the windows of heaven and the fountains of the deep will be opened up, and there will be such a mighty flood that will cover the whole earth. The scientists of the day, if there were any, the philosophers of the day, if there were any, the historians of the day, if there were any, the wise men of the day, if there were any, would have said, Noah, it is impossible. And yet it came to pass, exactly as Noah said, because Noah said it from the Lord. And the philosophers and the scientists and the historians and the people of today, they're telling us that what we're going to study this morning, what we're looking at, they're saying, it is impossible. It is unlikely. How can such a thing happen? And yet, as the days of Noah were, and Noah warned them, Noah spoke to them, Noah prophesied to them, Noah told them of those things before they came to pass. And so shall it be at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. In John chapter 4, Jesus Christ in his prophetic ministry. John chapter 4. Here we're looking at Jesus Christ and his ministry. What he did and what he made known unto the woman. The woman, in verse 19, said, The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Said, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Then that's Jesus Christ. I've told you, he is Savior. But not only that, he is prophet. In verse 42. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. The Savior of the world. So you can see that this Jesus Christ is both Savior and Prophet. In Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 31. Although what we need is verse 33, but you need to understand it from verse 31. The same day, there came certain of the Pharisees, saying unto him, Get thee out, depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. And he said unto them, Go ye, and tell that false. Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must walk today. And tomorrow and the day following for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem referring to himself and referring to the fact that his prophet Luke chapter 24 verse 19 Luke 24 verse 19 it says, after Jesus had risen from the dead, and there were two men that were discussing, discussing about him, and he joined the two of them, and asked them what they were discussing, and then they said, was well, see a stranger in Jerusalem, and he did not know the things which had happened in these past days, then in verse 19, and he said unto them, what things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. Here you find again the conviction of the people. And the statement that they made about him. The fact that he was regarded as prophet. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, from verse 10 and verse 11. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, 
saying, Who is this? And a multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And so you will see the conviction in those days concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Savior, yes. King, yes. The great high priest, yes. The propitiation for our sin, that is true. Also, the great prophet. Now you go to Matthew chapter 24 again. Verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Here is how we know a prophet, because we are told in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy, that if somebody rises up to say that he is prophet, and if his words do not come to pass, then you say that that's a false prophet, that is no prophet at all. But if somebody is a prophet, and God has raised him up to be a prophet, whenever he says anything, that thing will definitely come to pass. Isn't that why we know that Moses was a prophet? Because all the things he said about the children of Israel before he died, all those things from year in years to come, generations to come, they have come to pass. Isn't this the reason why David is referred to not only as a king but as a prophet? Why? Because the things he said in the Psalms concerning even a person like Judas Iscariot, or concerning Jesus Christ that not one of his bones was broken. Or concerning Jerusalem or concerning Israel. All those things have come to pass. That's why he's referred to as a prophet. Why is Isaiah referred to as a prophet? Because all the things he said about Christ. About a son is a child is born. The son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful. That's why we're calling him a prophet, because his words have come to pass. Why do we call Jeremiah a prophet? Oh, he prophesied about many nations and about Israel. And he told the children of Israel they were going to spend 70 years in captivity. And an heir came and took the yoke of wood out of his neck and said, It is not so. God said, It will only be two years. And then Jeremiah said, If it was so, I would be happy. But God has not sent you. And in fact, he said, you have not made a yoke of iron for them. And eventually they went to captivity and they spent 70 years. What do we call Daniel a prophet? Because of all those things we read in the book of Daniel, that talked about the Middle Persian Empire, that talked about the removal of Belshazzar, that talked about the Romans and about the Greek people, that even talked about the coming of Jesus Christ. And those things have come to pass. We call him a prophet. Why do you call Osea a prophet? Because what he said came to pass. He talked about Jesus Christ. He talked about the children of Israel. He talked about their backsliding. He talked about their coming back to the Lord. Why do you call Joel a prophet? Oh, because you see what he prophesied about. The desolation of the children of Israel. Not only that, the revival. That will come because he said it shall come to pass. In those days, says the Lord, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. And when Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, when it occurred, and the people were amazed at the saying, what is all this? Then Peter rose up and he said, This is that which was prophesied by Joel. Now when you call somebody a prophet, it means that all the things that he has said from the Lord, they do come to pass. And we have referred to Jesus Christ as prophet. And as prophet he said, Heaven and earth shall pass away. The sky, the sun, the moon, there's a time they will pass away. But then he said, My words shall not pass away. My words shall not pass away. What words will not pass away? All his words. Everything he ever said. And there is no time in one single message to begin to tell you all the things that Jesus said. But let's look at this in particular. Now, immediately, immediately, he said, My words shall not pass away. He begins in verse 36. That's very significant. That's very significant. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And then immediately to illustrate, when he says, my word shall not pass away, he said, look at this one, this will not pass away, verse 36. But of that day and hour, 
knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days that of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. As we look at the prophetic significance of Noah's days, the six points we need to look at, just from the passage that Jesus Christ has given, concerning the time of Noah, we need to learn that the events that took place then, they are similar to the events that will take place at the end of this age. Number one, previous prophetic warning. At that time, in the time of Noah, and at this time also, when we know that the end is about to come, when we know that the coming of the Lord draws near according to scripture, when we know that things are getting ready, all things are gathering up, they are gathering momentum for the appearance of the Lord and for the taking away, the rapture of the church and for the opening of the floods of tribulation and trouble and anguish upon this world. When we know things are about to happen, we need to realize, number one, there was previous prophetic warning and today there is also previous prophetic warning. We will be referring to all these points, first of all refer to the time of Noah and then refer to the time of our own day, the church age, the dispensation in which we live. So then go first to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 from verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast and a creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repented me that I have made them. Here we have prophetic warning. Noah was warned. Noah was told that this will happen. Remember that Noah had found grace in the sight of God. And so God will not bring the flood without telling him and warning him. Remember the church has found grace in the sight of God. And therefore he has not left the church in ignorance. He has warned us of the things that will definitely happen. And this is part of the warning we have read in Matthew chapter 24. Look at it again. Matthew chapter 24. Here is the prophetic warning before it happens. From verse 38. For us in the days that were before the flood. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Here is a warning for us there. It says, when the Son of Man shall come, the world will be preoccupied with material things, with eating and drinking, with also marrying and giving in marriage. And if you look into the world today and you look at the preoccupation, and you look at the things that arrest their attention, there's no time to think about spiritual things. There's no time to think about salvation, about righteous living. There's no time to think about things that will prepare us for eternity. Even people that come to church, their preoccupation is, you know, I need money. I need food, I need shelter, I need provision. Even in any church, especially Pentecostal churches. Many people rush to Pentecostal churches because, well, well, if they get to the Pentecostal church, many Pentecostal churches today emphasize prosperity. That in this hard time, in this difficult time, you'll be able to eat and drink without any limitation. 
Because you know manna will come. Because job will come. Because days will come. And many people rush in there. And even in this church that we call deeper life, the emphasis is no more the life that is deeper than the shallow ones that you see outside. The emphasis is not only on the deeper Christian life, a ministry that ushers you into Christian living. That's why we call it deeper Christian life ministry. And a deeper life Bible church, a church that is centered on the Bible, a church that is centered on Christian living, the life, a church that is more than just the surface thing, the superficial thing, deeper Christian life ministry or deeper life Bible church. But now you find many people running into deeper life, not because of the life, not because it is deeper, not because it has a ministry, not because it is going to center on the Bible, but because of eating and drinking. Because if they pray for me, I will get job. If they pray for me, I will have child. If they pray for me, I will have the material things of the world. And even not only that, even those of us who say that, well, we know what it means to be saved and sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost, you will realize that whenever somebody comes to give a testimony, he's got a new job, he's got a fantastic salary, he's got a new house, he's got material things, you will see the, the people they call deeper life, you see them clap like they do in the stadium. When somebody comes and says, do you know, I've been praying and yesterday I just got sanctified. They look at him and then say, and so what? Go and tell other people. They're not interested in that. And these are the things that Jesus warned about. That just before the time of his arrival is coming. It says that the people will be eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Marrying and giving in marriage. Think about it. Think about it. We make marriage now the big, big thing. And even, you know, among those who say they are workers, if you are in the marriage committee, it's like you are promoted higher than all the other people. If you are looking into marriage affairs, it looks like you are in such a place of authority and such a, an untouchable place that you know, you know I'm, I'm part of that marriage committee. And you know we have to. We don't meet every time. We don't take water baptism as serious as marriage committee. We don't take sanctification as, as very strong, as very important. Sanctification, holiness, the thing that prepares us for heaven. There is no committee on holiness. There is no committee on discipline. There is no committee on even the Lord's Supper. Think about it. There is no committee on carrying out the word of God. But there is a committee on the marriage, marriage committee. You know that, you know, everything that we do is, you know, the marriage now. And every prayer... You think about prayer and think about prayer partner. There's no prayer partner on sanctification. There's no prayer partner on living for righteousness. But his prayer partner, you know, my brother, uh, what's your condition? I've not married. What's your condition to have not married to you? Let's be prayer partner. And that prayer partner, they begin to pray and begin to pray. They will pray in the night. They'll pray in the morning. They'll pray while they are walking. They'll pray with their eyes open. They'll pray in the market. They'll pray anywhere. And when one of them gets to know the will of God, and then comes to the other brother and say, I know the will of God right now. And who is the fellow? And he says, the sister so and so. And this prayer partner to you, that's exactly the sister so and so. He had in mind that prayer partnership is going to break up. Not only that it's going to break up hatred and envy and jealousy and attack and destroying one another because of marriage. That's what Jesus said. You show me any district today in this deeper life in this city or in this state where the preoccupation every time is not on marriage and on marriage and on marriage. Marrying and giving in marriage. And there are even people that will never attend evangelism kind of thing. But if they hear that marriage is taking place in that place, they rush there. At least if they even miss the marriage ceremony, they can meet the reception. And being the reception, there are people that try to attend marriage ceremony every month they are having marriage. Now you think about it, and that's what Jesus Christ said. Prophetic warning, before it comes to pass, it says that, there will be marrying and giving in marriage. And when you think about the marrying and the giving in marriage, you realize how people run to the village to even try to get married. 
how people go to marry unbelievers, how people marry witches and wizards. And you know, the marriage that you are talking about, it, you know, it will be, it is shocking sometimes. Uh, how some people will say, well, you know, I got married, but then it was not the will of God. A man saw me this week, uh, you know, in my counseling time, and uh, he said that uh, the, the wife I married had married before. And, uh, you know, God give you wisdom when you counsel. These people can drive you to hell as a counselor. And they told me that that wife, uh, you know, actually, it's not, I said, is she a believer? I uh, said, no, she's not a believer at all. I said, are you a believer yourself? Said, yes, I'm a believer. And, you know, when she said, when he said, the woman had married before. Now, the natural thing for me to have said is just to say, well, if the person has married before, uh, well, you know the word of God, you know the teaching in the Bible, that if you marry somebody that married before, then you know what to do. Restitution. I just asked him. I said, when did you marry? And then he told me the year. When did you say you were born again? He told me the year. Then you were born again before you were married. Oh, yes. Uh, then I just said, where were you married? And he said, in deeper life. How many years ago? A few years ago. And because he had some disagreement with that woman, wanting to kick that woman away, he came to tell story. Because he knows once he tells that story in deeper life. That the fellow had married before, deeper life will say, final, without asking other questions. You see what the people are doing today? That all their preoccupation, they will even want to get the whole church into the mess they have gotten into. Marrying and giving in marriage. And this is a warning that we have even before the time will come. Look at Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21 reading from verse 34. Take heed to yourselves. Lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with self-eating and drunkenness and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. As a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the whole earth. All the whole earth. You see this is a warning before it comes. It says take it. Take it. Lest at any time, lest at any time, your hearts be overcharged with sore fitting. You see, the heart of the believer is so delicate that the believer should not be overcharged with anything in the heart. You see, in your own life, if there comes any event in your life, legitimate and proper, but then it occupies your heart so much. In the day you are thinking about it. In the night you are thinking about it. In the morning you are thinking about it. Even if it appears to be a good thing. That thing has taken away Christ from you. You know a person like me that understands the Bible. A person like me that studies the Bible. I see some things that people don't see. And I see that people can be drunk. They don't take alcohol anymore. They are drunk. They don't take beer anymore. They are drunk. And they don't take all the rum and all the things in the world. But they are dr they're drunk. Because you see, there are things that can make a person drunk. And your heart is overcharged with that thing. You know, sometimes in this church, and you know, it bothers me and it maybe daggers me in my heart. That some sometimes somebody becomes a house fellowship leader. And the house fellowship leader, that position takes seven away from him. He carries that house fellowship in the head. He has that label going about. His walking is different. His attitude is different. He says, now I'm a house fellowship leader. He begins to talk raw. He begins to act raw. He begins to behave in a way he wasn't behaving before. Because position has made him to become drunk. And Jesus said, here is a prophetic warning before it comes. That lest at any time, at any time, at any time. You know, I've been so challenged by some of our students in this, uh, in this church and at the headquarters church. And I do not want to make them proud. I just want to tell you that I, I was surprised. Well, I wasn't surprised in the sense I thought it could never happen. But I was surprised that in this the same age and in this same generation, 
when I see that a lot of people, they do not take the things of God seriously. When we're going to have this workers retreat, you know, this is number six. We had number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six. And I happen to know one, some of the students that were in their final year. And you know, those if you are at the university, the university work is quite, is quite something. And eventually, uh, I, I saw some of them, and I called the particular brother. I said, when are you going to have your final? So he said, I'm having it uh, in a few weeks' time. I said, uh, I would release you. And he smiled and said, I'm all right. I would still like to come. And I saw him in one of the workers' retreats. I was thinking, well, he wants to attend that workers' retreat. After attending the workers' retreat, he'll go and concentrate on his work. And I saw him in another workers' retreat again. And then I think I must have called him two times. I must have said, well, make sure you prepare for your exam. Make sure that things are okay because you'll be in this university for, you know, some time and you need to get settled and uh, get your papers. Workers retreat if Jesus tarries, you know, he's still going to be there. But this exam, concentrate on it. He smiled and said, yes, sir, I'm all right, uh, Pastor. Uh, things will be okay. And, uh, you know, so uh, I think maybe he missed out uh, one or two. And then eventually went after finishing the exam. I was surprised another workers retreat we have after finishing the exam. They, you know, here the brother was again. Wanting to just make sure that the things of God will be number one in his life. Some people are drunk with education. They are drunk completely. And they, can, they won't do any other thing because education is there. And, uh, you know, another student uh, in this uh, same Lagos, uh, this uh, one, a lady... And, you know, she came and she came and she came. And I was wondering, when are these uh, people going to have their exam? And uh, another, I knew when they started the exam. So, where well, we were in the workers' retreat again. And I'd attended one, I'd attended two and others. And I saw her again at the workers' retreat. I said, have you finished your exam? And she said, no, it remains one paper. And yet came to workers' retreat. And not just one workers' retreat, but coming over and over and over again. You know, it is good if your heart is detached from the things of this world. Education is there, but you take it with a loose hand. Not that you don't want to pass your exam, but you know that the coming of the Lord is very, very important. Marriage is there, you want to get married, but you take it with a loose hand. Not that if the marriage does not work, or if something happens and it goes the other direction, then you run away from the church. Or that you want to be healed, healing is wonderful. But if the healing is there, beautiful. If the healing is not there, there you are. You are still in the world, in the work of God. Or maybe this work of God we're even talking about. The work is there. You are appointed to do this and you are appointed to do that. And maybe you are disciplined, justly or unjustly. It doesn't matter. Maybe you are taken away from the work properly or in an in a pro, in proper manner. That doesn't matter. That thing has not gone into your head, into your mind, into your belly, into your system. That you'll say, well, what am I doing in the church again? Since the thing I came for, since the thing I'm interested in, since what I've given my life, consecrated everything on, they've taken it away from my hand, what am I looking for again? Oh, you are looking for heaven. You are not looking for work. You're looking for the glory of God. You're looking to escape the great tribulation that shall come upon this world. That's why you are here. It's not because you are called any name or because you are given any position. And so it says, take it. And beware, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with sore pitying and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And the cares of this life. And the cares of this life. You know, it's um, when you understand the Bible, your life changes completely. We had one of our workers retreat here. And because my uh, people... Uh, it's not, they've not seen me for a long time. Uh, so they we have a deeper life church in, in our village, if we call it a village or town, whatever I want to call it. And so my grandmother uh, sent two people and said, go and tell him that I need to get his attention. And now that they're going to have the workers retreat, make sure you get to him. And so on the first night when I came Wednesday, I was told that as the people were coming, that these two people followed them from a family. They are not workers. They are not members of deeper life. Just to see me, to get my attention. 
And then the person, one of the people, the ushers came to tell me that, you know, they, they told my wife, and my wife told me. So I told my wife, go and tell them they have no right to be in the workers' retreat. This is workers' retreat. And as I won't see them, because they're not even supposed to be here now. Who oh, you say you are fanatical. That's how those who are going to heaven are fanatical. And then we continued. Wednesday. First day passed. Friday passed, and then on Saturday, I opened up to counsel the people that needed counseling. And then they told me that those two people are still around. So I said, okay, they can come now, because now we're finished workers' retreat. That's my first assignment. That's why I came over here. That's why I left the town to come here. This I didn't come here because of family matter. I came to do the work of God and to concentrate on the word of God. You see, you don't want to allow anything to divert your attention from what ought to be done. And then eventually, uh, you know, the, the people, uh, you know, allowed them to come in. And of course, other people are still waiting for counseling. And I said, oh, how are you? How are you? And I greeted them. What is the matter? And then told me about the matter. I said, that's all right. I don't normally go through. I go through the pastor in that place. Just greet them for me. And then within, uh, you know, 10 minutes, we finished everything. And I said, if you needed to ask any other questions, see people are outside, uh, see my wife and settle with her. Bye-bye, thank you, God bless you. And then the people came and, you know, for me to pray for after the whole thing. And this fellow had, you know, been trying to see me. Another one, you know, a relative, very, 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 very close relative. When, before I became a Christian, when I was still young, those were, you know, the few people that, you know, I related with. And eventually, you know, had been trying to see me, saying that, you know, I am, I am his sister, I am this, I am that. And the ushers there knew that I don't listen to stories. Workers retreat, I want to concentrate. And so they didn't tell me. So at the last day, when they all came for prayer, and, uh, you know, we prayed, and after I prayed for all of them, then I opened my eyes, and she was trying to tell one of the ushers she wanted to see me. Then I recognized that, ah, that's so and so. I didn't even know she had become, you know, so committed in deeper life to becoming to, you know, work as a tree. So I was joyful because of that. You know, when you are laboring on all the other people and you find some of your people that now they are born again. So I wanted to, you know, because of just that. So I said, okay, let that person see me. And two of them came. And uh, you know, I said, well, uh, what's your name again? What's your name again? I've even forgotten one of their names. And uh, after they told me, and I said, okay, when did you become a Christian? How are you born again? And this and that. When did you become a worker? Once we said to her, I said, thank you very much. Others are still waiting. Bye-bye. Five minutes, we're finished. Now, you see, if you don't understand, your chart is overcharged with self-eating and drunkenness and the cares of this life. I must take care of this. I must take care of this. I must take care of this. I must take care of that. You will not understand Jesus Christ said that they will come upon you unawares. Are you telling us not to take care of, the, of our family? I'm telling you to love God more than father, more than mother, more than sisters, more than brethren. Because the Bible says if you love your father, your mother, and your brethren more than me, you are not worthy of me. Are you telling us to forsake all things? I'm telling you, Jesus himself said, don't think, don't think I've come to bring peace on the earth. I've come to bring fire and a sword and to divide in the same family two from three and three from two. And it's only when you cling unto the Lord and you say, whatever it will take, I'm going to go with the Lord. That is the thing that will make you to abide by the warning of scripture so that the day will not come upon you unawares. Point number two. Conditions before the flood. Conditions before the flood. You see, what, what were the conditions before the flood? And these will show you the conditions before the time of the coming of the Lord. And if you see that those conditions are here already, you better get prepared because it will not be long. When the trumpet shall sound. Conditions before the flood. Genesis chapter 6. Reading from verse 1. And it came to pass... When men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And he took them wives of all that they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. And then in verse 5, and God saw the wickedness of man 
was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And in verse 12, And God looked down, looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. That was the condition before the time of the flood. What will be the condition? Just before the end of this age. And just before the Lord will come. What will be the condition in 1 Timothy chapter 4? 1 Timothy chapter 4. Reading from verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. That in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Remember this is prophetic. Remember this is telling us things that will definitely without fail, happen near the time of the coming of the Lord. It says, the Spirit speaketh. How? Expressly. Very clearly and plainly. That in the latter time, some shall depart from the faith. Some people say there is such an eternal security that once you have come into the faith, you can never leave the faith again. Once you are born again, you are forever born again. Once you have come into the kingdom of God, you are always ever in the kingdom of God. The prophetic word of God says, no, that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, deceiving spirits, enticing spirits, and it says to the doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You see, there are people that are so hypocritical. And that's the sign of the last days. Hypocrisy is everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere. May even be at your own doorstep. May even be in your own Christian life. It says speaking lies in hypocrisy. And then it says having a conscience that is seared with a hot iron. The conditions of the last days. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, from verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Here you understand, it says, These will be the conditions of the last days. And it says it will be perilous. It will be dangerous. And it says men shall be lovers of their own selves. I know that many times when we preach about this, we generally will apply it to people outside and to sinners. Oh, we say, don't you see that the conditions of the last days are upon us and people are lovers of their own selves. I'm going to ask you those who say they are Christians in your district, in your area. Are they not lovers of their own selves? They hide, they are false, they magnify the faults of other people. They expose the faults of other people. They report this person is doing this, this person is doing this, this person is doing that. And the, fellow, the lady talking herself is a criminal, is a sinner. It's a secret sinner. And yet, lovers of their own selves. And they take care of themselves. Don't you see if we're serving food? Don't you see the people out they care for themselves and they don't care whether anything gets to other people? Don't you see if we get to the hostel? The way we look for the best for ourselves. And we do not look, we don't think about the other people. Lovers of their own selves. And don't you see how we, how we take care of our people? You know, in this uh, church, I praise the name of God. I do not allow my relatives to, you know, take any position. And I have some people that I know are born again, very, very close. In fact, uh, some of them, uh, you know, bear the same surname with me. Not in Lagos, they are outside. In fact, I've been so very strict. I do not allow people of the same mother, the same father to get to any member of the church. I want the particular brother of mine, I said, if you come to this Lagos and use my name with any member of the church to get anything, I'll be very serious with you. And because of that, he couldn't even get a job in Lagos. I wouldn't allow him to stay here and use my name. 
I said you can get to another town, you can be in another place. Deeper life is not a family thing that you don't use my name just because you have the same parents. You see, there are people that don't understand and they will put, uh, you know, their junior brother there, their junior sister there. Even when these people are not qualified to work for God, when they are not qualified spiritually, and if you see those uh, relatives of theirs do anything wrong and you'll say, um, you know, coordinator or so-and-so, look at so-and-so and say, yes, yes, you know, give him time to grow. Give him time to develop. Uh, nobody is perfect. When you report other people, it just... You just flings like those people away and say, this is not right. You are reported that you are doing this. But when they reported your own junior brother, your own junior sister, what did you do? Lovers of their own selves. You see, in the condition in which we are, it is not only applicable to the people outside, it is applicable to the people that are inside. Because to make the rapture is a very, very, very high standard. The word of God. Well, if you say, well, I don't believe that, you'll miss the rapture. You'll, be, you'll believe when we are gone, when a great tribulation takes place and you are here. You will remember all the things that were said. You will remember the things that disqualified you. Lovers of their own selves. Lovers of their own selves. It says, unholy, unthankful, unthankful. There are people that are not grateful for anything. Not grateful for anything. You know, in the past, whenever we preach, we used to say, you know, those people outside, no matter what you do for them, no matter what favor you give them, they are unthankful, they are ungrateful. Today, it is the majority of people that call themselves members of a church. Unthankful and ungrateful. And it is the spirit of the last days. Look at it from verse 3. Without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent fears, despisers of those that are good have you found that in our church here despisers of those that are good you know here you are and you know as a pastor you need to make this fellow give a message because uh, you know I've, there are some of the people i give messages who have never listened to them i mean give a message and yet you I'm, I'm committed to training people. I'm committed to giving this a chance and giving this a chance and giving this a chance so that they can grow, so they can develop. And sometimes when you give opportunities like that, there are some people that feel that that opportunity should have been given to them and then they will pick holes in everything that was said. And while discussing with other people, they will say, well, it's pastor. Let him put you, whoever he likes there. Don't you see the introduction of that man's message? Don't you see that point? Don't you see that point? Even the one teaching side of scripture in our own local church can do better than that. But that's the person they want to put there. Good luck to deeper life. You see that attitude? To coach down the other people that they cannot do anything and they must not do anything. And these selected few people are the only people that can do everything. You see, that's what the Bible says, that these people are despisers of those that are good. The conditions of the world today, and maybe it is like that in your own area. It is like that in your own heart. It says traitors and heady and high-minded and lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such, turn away. You see, that is what it takes. And these are the conditions that are going to be there before the coming of the Lord. In Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. And reading from verse 26. And as it was in the day of Noah, so shall it be also in the day of the Son of Man. They did eat. They drank. They married wives. They were given in marriage. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also shall it, as it was in the days of flood. They did eat, and they drank, and they bought, and they sold, and they planted, and they builded. But that same day that Noah went, that Lord went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, and destroyed them all. Now you can see the, the preoccupation of people today. The preoccupation is buying and selling and merchandise and trading and going this way and going that way. In fact, you know, it concerns you so much now that the richer people become, the more, uh, the less they take the word of God. And a lot of things that go on, 
the bribery, the corruption that is going on in a lot of places. And, uh, you know, those were the good days when if any worker, if any I mean a worker outside, not worker in the church, takes a deep alive person and you say, I am deep alive. Are you sure you are deep alive? Once they are sure that person is deep alive, they can leave their bank account, they can leave their checkbook on the table, they can leave all their money on the table, and nothing will happen. Because the deeper life person is working with us in that office. But today, if somebody comes to work in your place of work and says, I'm deep alive, even a deeper life worker, <laughs> if you leave your checkbook on the table, don't come to me to complain. I told you, the deeper life of today is different. Workers retreat, you come, you leave uh, the hostel, you don't lock your box and say, eh, because we came to walk us retreat. Ah, <laughs> you are gone. Those days, you don't need padlock on your box if you come to walk us retreat. You don't need anything. You just, you know, you, why do you need a padlock? All your salary, you have just finished, you have just collected your salary. You put it in your box and you run to walk us retreat without any padlock. Nobody will touch your money. Those are workers of deeper life. Today, you leave your transport money to go back home in your box. And you say, workers, you workers retreat. Before you finish this message I'm talking about, check up in your box. Something has happened. Oh, the Lord is about to come. Conditions of the last days. That people, they want money at all costs. They want material things at all costs. And this is the reason why those supposed to have responsibility of preaching in this church say it the way it is of course people they may hate you what's the problem with you the stone steaming if they stone you will come and bury you and you go to heaven when they are stoning you look up and see jesus christ standing on the right hand of god but if you are afraid, they will insult you, they will abuse you, they will stone you you cannot work for god and you cannot preach the gospel and so let us understand, these are the conditions of the things that will be happening when it comes near to the time of Christ's appearance. Number three, certainty of his coming. The certainty of his coming. Let's go back to Genesis again. Genesis chapter 6 from verse 17. Genesis chapter 6 from verse 17. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. And then in verse 18, And with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come unto the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons, Wives would be. Now God told Noah, this is certain. This is going to happen. I will come and I will preserve you. I will take you into the ark of safety. And then after that, you will see that the flood will come upon the whole earth. Are we certain that the Lord is coming? Are we sure that the Lord is coming? In Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. From verse 9. Acts 1, 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as they went up, behold, two men, actually angels, stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? They same Jesus which is taken off from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. It is definite the Lord is coming back. But then there is uncertainty about the day of his appearance, the day of his coming. Nobody knows, as we have read together already. Let us read it again for confirmation. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. The certainty of his coming is there, the uncertainty of the time is there. And in verse 37, but as the days of Noah, were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The flood came, the Son of Man is coming. 
The tribulation will come after that. And in verse 39, I knew not until the flood came and took them all the way, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. There is a certainty of his coming. There is the uncertainty of the time. In verse 42, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Your Lord doth come. That's the certainty of his coming. Ye know not what hour. That's the uncertainty of the time. In verse 44, therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. The Son of Man cometh. The certainty of his coming. And yet it says in that same verse that in such an hour as ye think not. You are not certain of the time. Verse 15. And the Lord of that servant shall come. There's a certainty of his coming. The Lord of that servant shall come. But then the uncertainty of the time. In a day when he looketh not for him. And in an hour that he is not aware of. And so we know the certainty of his coming. Then the uncertainty of the time. Point four. Rapture before the great tribulation. Rapture before the great tribulation. In Genesis chapter 7, reading from verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In the self same day, Entered Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind. And then in verse 15, And he went in unto Noah, into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. 16. And they went in, and went in, they that went in, went in, male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. And the flood was forty days upon the earth. And the waters increased, and bare up the ark, and it was lit up above the earth. Now you will see that Noah entered into the ark of safety before the flood came, which means the rapture will take place. Before the great tribulation will come. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Reading from verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant brethren. Concerning them which are asleep. That ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise forth. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's the rapture. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. The rapture will take place. The dead in Christ will rise. And then those of us who are alive at that time will be changed and transformed. Ever to be with the Lord. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. First Corinthians 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And so we know that the rapture is going to take place. And it can take place any time, any moment from now. And the moment the church is gone, the moment the church is taken away, immediately the great tribulation will come upon this world. That's point five. Tribulation and judgment of the ungodly. 
the great tribulation will happen after the church has been taken away. In Genesis chapter 7, verses 21 and 22. Remember Noah and the family that found grace in the sight of God were now saved in the earth. By the time you come to this verse 21 of Genesis chapter 7, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils, was the breath of life of all that was in the land they died. And so you will see that the suffering came, the judgment came upon the ungodly after the people had been saved in the ark in Second Peter. Second Peter chapter two. Verses four and five. Second Peter chapter two, verses four and five. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the blood upon the world of the ungodly. After the uh, family had been saved, away from the judgment, away from the flood. Then the judgment, the wrath of God, came upon the ungodly. After the church had been taken away, after the church had been raptured, then the great tribulation will come upon the people that are still, that are left in the world. What will the great tribulation look like? In Matthew chapter 24, from verse 21, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world. To this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those, they shall be shortened. There shall no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, the Jews, Israelites, those days shall be shortened. It tells us of the intensity of problem, wrath of God, indignation and judgment, that will come upon the land, the world, at that time. In Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30. From verse 6. Ask ye now, and see whether a man does travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his sons on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he, Jacob, but he, a remnant of Israel, shall be saved out of it. And so the time of the great tribulation will be a time of great wrath, a time of great suffering. We cannot exhaust the suffering of the time of the great tribulation. But let's look at a few references. Revelation chapter 6. From verse 15. Revelation chapter 6. Verse 15. And the kings of the earth. And the great men. And the rich men. And the chief captains. And the mighty men. And every bondman. And Every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? The time of the great tribulation will be the time of the wrath of God, a time of trouble, a time of suffering. A time of indignation and wrath, a time of desolation. And it says, the terrible thing or the terrible nature of the tribulation will be so great and the wrath will be so intense that it says, who shall be able to stand? Who shall be able to stand? Let's look at chapter 9. Some of the things that will be happening at the time of the great tribulation. Revelation chapter 9 from verse 2. 
and he opened the bottomless pit. And there arose the smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt grass or of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when it striketh a man. At the time of the great tribulation, well, there will be a lot of trouble, not enough food to eat. There will be a lot of sickness. Not only that, this peculiar demonic satanic thing released upon the whole world. That the locusts will bite men, stink men. And the pain of that sting or stinging will remain there for five months. And there will be no injection that can kill the pains. It will be so terrible. In fact, the Bible says they will be looking for death. They will not die. In verse 6. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it. And shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. When the condition is so tense and so terrible. That people will want to die and yet there will be no death. Because of the pain. It will be a terrible thing to still be here at a time of the great tribulation. In verses 20 and 21. And the rest of the men, which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship the devils, and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Here you see the, the terrible thing that will happen. And yet all that will not make the people to repent. All that will not make the people to repent, they will still continue in their rebellion. Is it not happening today? That sometimes uh, you find there are people now in the world that they have been sick. And yet, in their sickness, they will not seek the Lord. They will not uh, pray to the Lord. In their sickness, they will not say, Well, I know that I've done wrong. I know that they sin they not, I've done is not right. I need to seek the Lord. It says that they still continue with their sorceries and their fornication and their evil. The same thing you even find in the church. You see, discipline is supposed to correct. It's supposed to chastise a person to the point he feels or she feels the pain. And then says, because I know that I'm being chastised for my sin, for my error, for my weakness, for the frailty of my life. I should not continue like that. But unfortunately, do you know that in the days in which we live now, discipline doesn't change people anymore. You discipline them and say, and so what? You correct them and they say, and so what? If, uh, you know, if uh, it's so hard in this place, I go to another place. Instead of the discipline or the correction or the chastisement, correcting them, it just makes them to continue the way they are. And you know, I see that not only in the ordinary house fellowship leaders, if we call them ordinary. I see that in various places. I see that in various categories of workers. And, you know, especially, I notice that it is when I talk against a sin and I read all the Bible, I can read about it. And I say, this is not right. Deeper life must change. And the people that are peculiarly behaving in such a bad way, and they do that thing after that message, to show me that, you know, no matter what you preach, no matter what you say, when deeper life, when deeper life, there's nothing you can do about it. They just repeat exactly the same thing. You will think that if we have two weeks of sad description on hypocrisy, you will think after two weeks of sad description on hypocrisy, hypocrisy will die. You will never hear about hypocrisy in the church anymore. I'm telling you that two weeks of learning, again, learning something against hypocrisy has not solved the problem. And all the questions and answers that the pastor can handle on hypocrisy and whatever it is, it has not solved the problem. And if you mention it in the preaching, you mention humility. In fact, the more I talk about humility, the more people become proud. Just to show that, well, Pastor, if that is your definition of humility, I'm sorry, I don't take that definition. The way I was doing before, exactly what I will do. 
that sin will multiply at the time of the great tribulation that sin will multiply at the time when the church has been taken away i mean the true church the glorious church the sanctified ones when the church has been taken away and then the wrath will come you will see that the people are going to repent and they are going to change the bible says no they will even be cursing god who has brought all that plague and all that trust and all that chastisement upon them if your life is like that don't you know that that is the spirit of the time of the tribulation the time of the great tribulation that you will never listen to correction you will never make a change in your life exactly the evil you are doing before is evil that you continue but i think in a workers retreat like this we should allow the grace of god to come in because if the workers retreat does not change us the general retreat is not going to change us and the sunday worship is not going to change us and the Monday Bible study case that is not going to change us. And a combined service Thursday is not going to change us. Because this uh, workers retreat is the highest thing that we know in deeper life that can change people. That can turn people around. That can knock them and pierce them. That can make them get on their knees before God and say, God, if I've done evil, I will do no more. And that's the reason we're here. I pray we will change. And you know you are not changing for me. You are changing to make the rapture. You are not changing because of me. You are changing because you want to please the Lord. You are changing because you know that the Bible says, Without holiness no man shall see the Lord. You are changing because the Bible says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, because whom he loves, he chastises, so that we will be partakers of his holiness. So it is very, very important. Our lives must change. And if you are just here, that, uh, you know, you are just here because I just want to go to that workers retreat because I know what I'm going to do since they stop our language church. I've not been happy with deeper life. Who introduced language church? You didn't appeal to me before language church came. You didn't try to petition before language church came. I came up and arranged the language church. And if I arrange the language church, don't I have the right to rearrange the language church? Who made you a language coordinator? Didn't, it wasn't it the pastor that said, okay, let's have a coordinator there, let's have a coordinator there. And then after I made it and I saw that we need to make some corrections and develop you before you can continue. I said, now let us do it this way again. Why are you angry? What's the problem with you? Did you pay for it? Are you doing anything to merit it? Is it not by grace alone? Is that the, is it the language coordinatorship that will take you to heaven? What's the matter? Why don't you know where we are coming from and where we are and where we want to go? I think we ought to know where we are going. We want to go to heaven. Whether there is, uh, you know, the possibility of language coordinator or not, or no language coordinator, there's no problem. It says, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Once this church is giving you the word of holiness, the word of holiness, I think that is what we're looking for. Am I right? But you know, we begin to say deeper life is not good again. It was good when you were language coordinator. And the day that you were stopped from being language coordinator, deeper life is not good again. When there was position, it was good. It was good. You know, those days, uh, you, I see those language coordinators that didn't have opportunity of talking to me very freely before coming near. You know, they, uh, now because they're language coordinators, they were say, my pastor, my pastor, my pastor, my pastor. Now when I said, uh, no language coordinator again, I don't see them again. There's no my pastor again because uh, they took my title away. They took my portfolio, my portmanteau away. They took my post and my credentials. They took it away. And so deeper life is not good again now. Why do we behave like little children? When you are giving peppermint and toffee and sweet, you smile, you will run and go and take a cup of water for daddy. But when there is no peppermint, not enough sugar in your gari, you will not be able to do anything again. What's the matter with this church? Let us repent. Let us call upon the Lord. And let us say, Lord, I'm here to make heaven. When, when there's chastisement, I want to make heaven. When there's rebuke, I want to make heaven. When there's correction, I want to make heaven. That leads me to point six, preparation to escape the tribulation and the judgment. Preparation to escape. Preparation to escape. Let's go back to Genesis again. 
chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, from verse 7. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repented me that I have made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and Noah walked with God that's how he escaped that judgment he escaped the flood he walked with God how about today how can we escape Luke chapter 21 Luke chapter 21 from verse 36 watch ye therefore and pray always watch ye therefore and pray always what should be the item of our prayer request? That ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and shall and to stand before the Son of Man. Well, the first thing you notice here is this. If it is automatic for every believer, every Christian, every disciple, everyone that is reading the Bible, everyone that is called by the name of Christ, if it is automatic to escape the great tribulation, Jesus would not have said, Watch ye therefore and pray always. Pray always. This is not a prayer you pray only once. Or a prayer you pray only twice. Or a prayer you pray only a few times. It says, You will watch therefore and you pray always. You pray that you may be able to, you may be accounted worthy to escape. All the things that shall come to pass so that you can stand before the Son of Man. Why would Jesus say you pray always? Well, you won't see the invisible enemy. But there's a Satan out there. Very, very close and very near to you. That since you took the step, I want to go to heaven. He says, ah, how can you go to heaven when I've been bad? When I've been taken away from heaven, I'm going to hell. He says, no, you will not go. And don't you remember? Since you became born again, it has been battle over battle. Battle in the home. Battle in the local church. Battle in the extended family. Battle in the place of work, battle among friends, battle among relatives. What's that telling you? Oh, it's telling you that the devil says, no, you are not going. No, you are not going. Since you became a Christian, and every time you say, I want to make heaven, I want to make heaven, the devil says, no, you, you cannot make it. And it may make so much trouble. That's why you need to watch and pray always. Watch and pray always. You know, sometimes you want to travel and you are at the airport. And it happens that the plane is delayed. And as the plane is delayed, you're already dozing. And where you are sitting, with your box by your side and valuables on your side, maybe the money you are taking away or whatever it is you have, it's right in that bag. And there are hundreds and thousands of people, they will not sleep. They'll be walking up and down. Walking for the, watching for the careless one that they will just snatch the bag while you doze off. By the time you wake up, every valuable thing is gone. You say, what? Where is my money? Where is my passport? Where is my ticket? Where is this? Where is that? Everything is gone. Here we are at the airport of the event of the last days. But the plane is delayed. The Lord, we thought he would have come. But he has not come yet. And here we are now. Although we have checked in, we have bought our ticket, we are born again, we have the genuine salvation of God within us. But then the flesh is weak. We are getting weary. We are getting tired. And a lot of things are happening. And here are demons going up and down. And Satan, their master, saying, target him. Target him. When he sleeps, take his passport. Take his ticket. Take his faith. When he does this off, or when he becomes too occupied with this and that, take that valuable away from him. We are not traveling, he is not traveling. We are not going, he is not going. And while you are dozing off, 
You find somebody by your side wanting to touch about you. What do you want? What do you want? And then he goes away. Then you keep awake. Then you put your back near you again. And he says, never mind. The time will come and we'll sleep all. He's still we're sleeping and waking. Just stay by him. Target him. Target him. That's what the devil is doing. There you sleep. There you forget your consecration. There you forget that the Lord is coming. Because you have put all your life in getting that ticket. You have put all your life in getting that passport to get to heaven. And there is a devil that targets you that says you will not go. And you want to go. Because once you miss that plane, there's only one plane, only one rapture. And if you miss it, you have missed it all. And a great tribulation will be here on earth. And people are going to be asking you, Ah, sister, you didn't go. Oh, sorry, mother. Brother, you didn't go. Why? Ah, your pastor has gone. All those your leaders have gone. Rise up and let us talk to the Lord in prayer. That by the grace of God you will make it. By the grace of God you will make it. You will not allow anything to take that passport, that ticket away from you. Are you getting tired? Are you getting weary? Do you want to miss heaven? Don't you want to make it at the time of the rapture? Watch ye and pray always.